huge improvements and a massive upward curve in all of our stated outputs, um, in our influence and standing as an organisation, and also our financial security. Um, so that's massive sort of increases in our outputs from rearing and our understanding of those processes. Big diversification of funding and, and revenue incomes. A much broader and hugely impactful spectrum of research going on um, at, the, at the building, at the organisation. And lots of outreach as well, still able to terrify small children with Larry Lobster. Um, but we're missing a fundamental measure of success and our success as an organisation, which is the monitoring of released lobsters for their impacts on the population of the fishery. So it's all very well and good releasing large numbers of what we assume are high quality juvenile lobsters here, but we really need to be able to identify them if we recapture them to show that they're actually lobsters. So why is it important to assess negative impacts of sparking? Well, we want to be preventing the negative impacts on the, targeting, on the target stock. Um, so there's lots of, we can't assume that by releasing lobsters, we're going to be having some good effect. But actually, there's a growing um, body of evidence that suggests in some cases, while stocking tends to lead to a short-term abundance increases, what this can actually be is a long-term fitness cost to the wild target stock. Um, so lots of problems with things like um, genetic adaptation to captivity and things like that, um, which we don't want to be introducing into the wild. So it's really important to check that we're not having a negative impact before we can be sort of going on about proving our positive impact. Then we want to be optimizing uh, protocols of stocking, so things like the best animal size, release density, settlement habitats, release methods, even conditioning steps before release. We're unsure of at the moment and we really need to work out what the best things, best things of those are to make our uh, stocking programs most effective. Then funders and fishermen. We really want to be able to quantify our effect size. We're quite good at that from an organisational point of view, but not from a fishery point of view. So, whereas we might be able to go to a, fish, uh, to a funder and say, you give us X and we can release Y, you know, you can allow us to release this number of lobsters. What we could do with impact assessment is actually be able to go to them and say, in future, you give us X, we'll release Y, and this will, this will cause Z. You know, this will allow us to have this many more lobsters out in the wild, this many will survive, causing this amount of influence on the fishery, this amount of increased uh, sustainability or revenue for fishermen. So getting evidence of that impact is vitally important, not only for uh, generating stakeholder support within the fishing communities, but also for writing more powerful bids for funding. At the end of the day, funders are essentially investors. So anything you can do to prove that they're going to get their money's worth, lower the risk, makes you a more attractive funding operation. Finally, does it work? That's the big question here. What makes stocking economically viable, and is it as good as alternative stock conservation strategies? I'm very optimistic that we, we can answer those questions positively, but if the answers are nothing and no, we might as well find out and know about it, because then we can spend our time doing other things, like watching TV, spending our time at home with the kids, or you know, even just going for drinks with friends, because there's more to our life than lobsters, <laughs> after all. Um, what do we know about lobster stocking then so far? Um, fortunately, what we know about lobster stocking has been recently summarised by some extremely good looking scientists. <laughs> um, this is a paper we've had uh, published this year, um, The Hatchery with, with Friends and Collaborators. Um, really important document, sounds a bit self promoty but everyone could benefit from reading this and, and understanding the issues within. Talks about what stocking's learned so far and what critical issues are moving forward. If you want a copy, come and find me. I can print you off one. Um, briefly, some of the things we found out about stocking where impact has been assessed, so this is work conducted by CFAS in the 80s and 90s in this country, particularly IMR in um, Norway in the 90s is that hatchery lobsters attain long-term survival, they recruit to the fishery, and they add to the spawning stock. Um, so they enhance, but not displace, natural stock, and in fact, where natural stock is really heavily depleted, they can out, you know, outnumber it. Um, and that female productive, uh, reproductive performance of hatchery lobsters is not different to natural stock, um, which is a surprisingly rare finding among um, stocking. So all of those are really positive outcomes. However, they come with a but, and that but 
is that at no time has stocking actually been shown to be economically viable at the recapture rates reported for these lobsters. Quickly, how are these results obtained? Well, they were obtained using physical implant tags. So, like the two um, pieces of sort of colourful silicon injected into the uh, abdomen of this lobster. So, it's perfectly possible, and physical tags have some pros, but they also have quite a lot of cons. Some of the pros, things like they're cheap and ambiguous, and in the case of physical ones like this, you can even um, allow the fishes to monitor themselves and have a social impact, but lots of negatives as well. So, tags can be lost. And Lisbeth actually estimated that 10% of coded wire tags are lost a year. And when you think that it might take five years to recapture your lobsters, that's a huge amount that you've lost and slipped through the net along the way. Um, there's also no data beyond the first generation. The babies of hatchery reared lobsters don't come out tagged. Um, there's no data to assess genetic impacts or stock integration. And most importantly of all, there's a minimum juvenile size applied. So we have to grow these juveniles on for a certain amount of time to be able to tag them safely, um, normally about a year. Which means there's no monitoring possible um, and conducted so far from the earliest onset of benthic behaviour, so things like stage four, stage five, the first post larval stages, when they, we could technically be releasing them. Um, and that means that we may well be releasing lobsters, or we probably are when we're having to ungrow them at this point, at um, life stages which are economically and also ecologically suboptimal. What else could we use? We could use genetics, because it's so pretty. <laughs> um, how can DNA replace tags? Well, genetic markers with high variability can effectively be used to tag individuals and um, reassign um, hatchery origin. Individual sort of unique genotype tags are possible using genetic markers where sort of everybody has a unique code, but that's not particularly um, what's the word I'm looking for? I've forgotten it. I don't know. It's not a particularly good way of doing it. Good's not the word I'm looking for, but uh, it's expensive to sample all the, your animals before you release them, and more than that, you have to grow them onto a certain size so you can take a tissue sample from them. So obviously you're then back in the same problem of having a minimum body size as for physical tags, which we don't want. More commonly, um, they can be used to identify um, hatchery stock via parentage assignment. So we can trace recaptures back to hatchery brood stock and dads, and that is how we can tell their hatchery lobsters. Uh, it's been used successfully in this method in stock salmonids, green and fin fish industry, as you can see there. Um, so how does it work? Well, if we've got a wild caught lobster here at the top, and we want to know if it's come from this hatchery female here, and this wild male, of course, she's mated in the wild, so we don't really know who he is, but we can actually find out the male's genotype by genotyping eggs from the female. So if we get a genetic profile of our, of our wild caught lobster, we want to compare it to the genetic profiles of these hatchery parental archives. And what we find out in this case is that every single one of its alleles actually comes from this parental pair here. So we can say that the chances of that happening by chance in the wild slim to well, none, effectively. So that is how parentage assignment actually works. And what are the benefits of monitoring via genetics? Well, we don't get that tag loss. Um, there are some error rates, but they tend to be small in comparison. They can be estimated and corrected. Uh, you get the potential for multi-generational recapture data. Uh, you can assess genetic impacts, fitness and stock integration, how well wild and hatchery stock are mixing. Um, you can even identify optimum genotypes for survival. There might be a particular genotype that tends to come up well, so you can maybe start to select for that. Most importantly though, it's the kind of method we can integrate with alternative release-based management strategies to actually compare it to other methods of fisheries management. So in the same way that we archive um, maternal brood stock tissue here at the hatchery, we could go on a boat and before a buried hen is returned into the wild, we could take a, a small maternal sample and some egg samples and do exactly the same for that so you can start to compare which is the method that's most effective. And really importantly, of course, we've got this problem of minimum juvenile size is completely eliminated. So we can release at any body size, which means there's no constraints on the size that we can release, and there's, it enables us to, comparis to make comparisons to find out what is the most economic and ecological optimum release point. 
Next, is it going to be possible with lobsters? Well, it's certainly going to be harder than with fin fish. As Carly said, there's sort of selectively bred brood stock is, is quite common among the salmon olive industry and things like that. That means um, we've got more diversity here by sourcing from the wild. Actually, that's a good thing. That's, that's, we're happy about that because it's good for our fitness prospects. It makes it harder, but it's better. What we found out is that we've got really high microsatellite DNA diversity. There's markers that are available, high population genetic diversity in the regional population here, and that there's single paternity within clutches. So those are three really important questions to answer um, to check that genetic tagging was going to be possible. Single paternity within clutches is obviously important because it means we're only having to re-establish one male out of the egg groups, not lots, and it just what it just narrows that potential for parentage right down and um, it's very important it's slightly depressing that that's basically two years of my phd and i can fit on one slide but <laughs> <laughs> there we go um finally will it work well if we release this lobster here and five years later it's re-caught are we going to be able to recognize it before yeah we can go on before we try that in the wild, we wanted to check in simulations and in simulations of parentage assignment for an admixed stocked population, so wild and natural stock, sorry, natural and hatchery stock mixed together. And what I found it, I found it, is that error rates depend on the number of candidate parents tested against recaptures. So the more candidate parents we add to that mix, the more parents we have, the more false positives we get, while wild lobsters by chance match them. And that the proportion of the released individuals among recaptures is important because when that's very low, we tend to get false negatives. So we tend to miss the odd hatchery lobster um, up here when uh, the proportion of hatchery lobsters among the population is very small. But to answer the question, will this lobster be recognised? Well.